my name is Derpy Goose. I have an honours degree in linguistics and in my free time I like to write novels because it's fun. And today I wanted to take a deep dive into an aspect of language use and communication which can be pretty fun to see applied to both dialogue and narration. Grace's Maxines of Cooperative Communication. Why? Because cooperative communication, that is communication that obeys the shared expectations of speaker and listener, is efficient communication. It uses your reader's expectations to package a message in a way that can be most readily and reliably understood. And more often than not in writing, that is what we want. Seamlessly, almost invisibly, transplant a functional version of the world we see within our head into our reader's head. Understanding cooperative communication also allows us to understand and implement uncooperative communication. And whether you want to hide the answer in plain sight within your narration, or maybe you want to craft dialogue that reeks of tension, characters who just don't quite understand each other, there are many reasons why you might want to purposely go against the unspoken rules of communication. All right, let's get into it. We can think about communication in a very structured approach. Let's say I'm texting a friend, I'll be there at six. First, we have the two parties involved, the communicator and the communicatee. In linguistics, we often refer to this second party, the person receiving the communication, as the interlocutor. We then have the message, a text, so that's the mode of communication, with the words, I'll be there at six, that's the message content. But the message is actually just an attempt to transport information from person A to person B. It's a way of packaging that information up to convey it. It isn't the information itself. In this case, if I'm texting a friend, I'll be there at six, what am I actually trying to convey? What information do I want the interlocutor to learn from this communication? One possible example is that I'm trying to convey I'll be at the designated meeting spot, say the big clock at Melbourne Central, at approximately six in the afternoon, give or take five, ten minutes. This can be considered the information being sent. We can talk about this as what the communicator is implying via their chosen message. And it may or may not match the information being received, what the interlocutor infers from the message. For example, my friend may have gotten mixed up and thought we agreed to meet across the road at the State Library. Or maybe they're right and I'm the one who's mixed up. It doesn't matter. Either way, the result is that we both attribute different meanings to that little word there. Or my friend might be a bit more of a stickler for timekeeping than I am and infer that by six, I actually mean like six, six o'clock. Meanwhile, I assume everything is a bit more loosey-goosey and that there's no need to text I'm running late unless it's like more than 15 minutes late. Either way, even in a simple exchange like this, there is plenty of opportunity for the information the communicator is attempting to convey to be vastly different to the information the interlocutor receives. And this is what cooperative and uncooperative communication is all about. Cooperative communication describes messages which have been packaged with the expectations and assumptions of the interlocutor in mind. So as the message will most likely be understood in the intended way. Uncooperative communication describes messages that have been packaged so when they are put through the interlocutor's assumptions, the information received less closely matches the information set. For example, if I'm hosting a party and want my guests to start showing up around 7pm, I could send out invites saying that. That's the obvious way of packaging the information, surely? And yet, chances are if I were to do that in Australia, my guests will start showing up maybe at 9pm. Why? 
because at some point in time, everyone in my culture got together and agreed that, yeah, let's just decide party start times are like actually yeah, one, two, at least hours after the stated time. That makes sense. So given the set of assumptions that, that takes a start time and makes it two hours later, if you want the information received to match the information you intend to convey, be here at seven, you'll do best to package it up in a message of start time is five. But really, it's Transposition. If you know the modification values, you can just reverse engineer your message to ensure the information received aligns with what you want to convey. Except the modifier, the set of assumptions your interlocutor applies when they unpackage your message, is in someone else's mind. Uncooperative communication isn't necessarily lying. Nor is it necessarily the result of someone wanting to be difficult or uncooperative. Most often, it's just an error in predicting the set of assumptions the message will be viewed through. Get that wrong, you will package your message wrong. Each individual set of assumptions at any given moment are impacted by numerous things their past experiences, their views and values and expectation of what your views and values are, their knowledge set, social groups, relationship with the speaker, their culture and the languages they speak, their mood at the time. There are endless, endless ways for miscommunication to occur before we even consider purposeful attempts at misinformation. Now, this all sounds like a lot of mind reading. And the reality is that, yeah, good communicators will be changing up the way they communicate constantly in response to cues they're picking up from their audience. But when we write, we don't know who our audience is. Not at this fine level of detail. We can't even guess at these sort of things. And this is where Grice's maxims come in. Paul Grice noticed back in the 1970s that there seemed to be a number of patterns about how certain statements were likely interpreted, and he grouped together four specific suggestions for maximising your chances of being understood. You may not have been there when all English speakers shook hands and agreed, yeah, unless dictated otherwise, I will assume that these four attributes are true. You may not remember signing that contract, but chances are you two hold these four assumptions at least to some degree and in some contexts. They are the maxim of relevance, the maxim of quality, the maxim of quantity, and the maxim of manner. Before we take a look at each in turn, I want to be clear that these maxims are not rules. I'm not suggesting that these are the correct ways of communicating. Just because a specific discourse aligns with these maxims doesn't even mean it's necessarily good or clear communication. Rather, the way I view these maxims is as descriptions of widespread interlocutor assumptions. Just how widespread? Well, Rice doesn't exactly specify. His original paper is a bit more coming from the angle of what he thinks good, clear communication looks like based on his own experiences. Personally, I certainly wouldn't be basing any assumptions about the nature of language or the nature of humanity on these ideas. However, I do see some useful and certainly interesting concepts we can use and play with in writing and discard anything that isn't serving our purposes. So I just wanted to flag that that's the angle I'm coming from. So I just wanted to flag that that's the angle I'm talking about these ideas from. This definitely isn't a discussion of the validity of Grice's maxims within the principles of linguistics study. There has been numerous research since which does look at cross-linguistic applications, which digs into it all a little bit more. And that's certainly an interesting angle to talk about. But today I'm just looking at like, these are some cool ideas to think about in your writing and see what makes sense for what you're trying to achieve. All right, disclaimers aside, what are these maxims and how can we use them? First up, the maxim of 
quantity. This one states that interlocutors expect the communicator to provide all the information that is needed and no extra. This is a pretty simple one to understand and easy to follow in your day-to-day -day life. However, it does rely on something called theory of mind, which I did have a 10 minute discussion of in my original script, but I cut it out and I'll talk about it separately another day. It's that ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. So in order to know the correct level of information to give a person, you have to have a good understanding of what they need to understand as well as identifying information that is likely already known or so self-explanatory it doesn't need to be elaborated on. Providing too little detail results in confusion and that confusion can be extra frustrating as your audience expects the info you have provided to be sufficient to understand. Providing more information than needed, meanwhile, can be patronizing and condescending. Again, because your audience is expecting you to provide only the information you think they need. Therefore, going into great detail about very simple things suggests that you think your audience does not know these and needs that level of detail to understand. Let's take a look at an example within novel writing. Let's set the scene. It's near sunset. The dying light pooling over a gentle clearing in the woods, where our hero Eliza and her comrade Jordan are having a heated exchange. How many characters are in the clearing? Did you say two? Eliza and Jordan? Chances are you said two. And if you didn't, it's probably because of the context I provided this example in and you sneaky little person having worked out where I'm going with this. That doesn't count. That's just you being smart. If you were to read this in the context of a novel, you almost certainly would assume that if the writer has only told you about these two people in the clearing, there's only two people openly known to be in the clearing and will be confused if a third character who was maybe there the whole time, or maybe they entered partway through, but it was never mentioned in any way, suddenly starts contributing to the conversation. Technically, however, this scene, I never said that there was only two people. I said there was Eliza and Jordan. I didn't say there couldn't be more, but you expect me to give all the information you need to understand the scene. If there's gonna be three people in this conversation, you expect me to introduce that third person at a relevant moment not just for them to suddenly start talking. Let's contrast this with providing too much information. I live in the state of Victoria. I know when talking to people from overseas that this is likely to be insufficient information. They may know where Victoria is, but it's usually safer to elaborate and include that I'm from Australia, because the reality is chances are they don't know all the states of Australia probably don't even know that Australia has states. If, however, I was asked by someone from overseas, hey, where are you from? <laughs> and I replied, Victoria, you know, Australia, in the Southern Hemisphere, planet Earth, the Milky Way. That is much more information than is needed. And by giving more information, I am implying that I think they need all this more information. I'm implying that I think they're not gonna know where these places are. They're not gonna know where Australia is. I have to specify it's in the Southern Hemisphere. By shaping the amount of information one character provides another, we can show our audience how one character thinks about another. What assumptions they have about that other person. What assumptions they have about how much information that other person is going to need. If they look down on another character, think very little of them, they are likely to provide more information than is really needed. Or maybe you have a character infiltrating a different society as a spy or a runaway. They are probably gonna have to deal with confusing conversations where they are assumed to know more than they actually do. This is where exposition hidden in dialogue can cause problems. The idea being you can sneak info you want your audience to know into dialogue, have one character explain it to another. But the problem is when one character gives information to another who is likely to already know that information. It reads as patronizing, belittling, or just plain jarring. 
why are you telling your best friend of 15 years who has grown up alongside you in this magic society those basic laws of the magic system they also use? All right, maxim two, the maxim of quality. To be honest, this one is kind of on the more boring side in my opinion, but hey, that's just me. If you are a maxim of quality stan, sound off below. Let's show this guy some love, but you better be telling the truth about it. That's really the essence of the maxim of quality. Interlocutor expects the information they are being told to be correct, or at least correct to the best of the communicator's knowledge. And I can certainly see cases where this is very true, but I won't lie. Well, I might, you don't actually know, but this maxim was actually one that took a while to make meaningful sense to me. I guess I'm a bit of a cynical, untrusting, suspicious person because my first thought learning about this proposed theory that interlocutors expect information to be truthful was, do we? Like, lying is a known thing that happens, like, all the time. There is debate around how intent comes into play with this maxim, but even just taking intentionally mistruthful comments as flouting this maxim, breaking the maxim, you are probably lied to multiple times a day, and not even with any necessary malicious intent. Sometimes it's easier in a story just to simplify a few things, smooth over some not very relevant details. Or perhaps you're recounting an anecdote, you're going to tell it to the best of your abilities, but sometimes details will be blurry. You're pretty sure you were eight and things happened in that order, but it doesn't really matter to the point of the story, so you just go with it. The reality is we probably shouldn't assume the information being conveyed to us is correct and truthful to the communicator's knowledge, but should is not the question here. And whilst my immediate thought learning about the maxim was that no, I'm too smart to fall for the trap of thinking something's true just because someone told it to me, the truth is, <laughs> I am very much not. Yes, there are circumstances where I think this maxim just doesn't hold, where the interlocutor isn't expecting the communicator to be truthful. If I'm asking someone, did you take the cookie from the cookie drawer while they have cookie crumbs down their shirt and they say no, I'm probably not going to believe them. Certainly not going to go, wow, he said no, so there can't be any possibility that he did. Likewise, if someone tells me Australians ride kangaroos to school, I'm going to be like, cool story, you keep telling people that. It's not going to suddenly over ride my lived experience. Where the context or my prior knowledge contradicts the statement, then I'm probably going to be clued in that the statement may not be truthful. However, in contexts where there are no contradictions, no body language cues, the information isn't shocking or surprising or hyperbolic. Overall, there is no reason to suspect mistruth to be at play. Do you really question every utterance you hear? Probably not. And this has actually been shown to be a pretty powerful metric. If you are interested in the psychology of misinformation, you might have noticed that people are much more likely to believe what they hear first, because the first thing they hear doesn't contradict anything. But subsequent different information does contradict. Like I said, however, this maxim is not the most interesting when applying it to your writing or even day-to-day -day life. It might be helpful in narration to keep somewhat in mind that unless given reason otherwise, your audience is probably going to believe what you tell them. That could be fun to play with. A little unreliable narrator action. A character who is a good con artist or master manipulator is likely deeply aware of just how boldly they can lie, provided they don't give any reason for their victims to question. And if not, well, that just indicates how deeply suspicious your interlocutor is, which could be a fun way of showing just how jaded, untrusting a character is by having them question the validity of even mundane comments. Maxime three, relevance. The maxim of relevance suggests that interlocutors expect all information provided to be relevant and therefore, wherever possible, will interpret strings of information in such a way that every part is relevant, even if it's not true. Where did you get that jumper? Isn't Kmart amazing? The interlocutor, speaker B, didn't actually say they got the jumper from Kmart, but that's the easiest way to make the statement 
isn't came out amazing, relevant to the question, where did you get that jumper? And because we expect the response to be relevant, speaker A is probably going to interpret that speaker B got it from Kmart. Need a humorous misunderstanding to drive your plot? Maxim of relevance! Flout this baby. Flout as in break it. Provide information that isn't relevant. And you have the makings of a sitcom worthy misunderstanding. Everyone assuming the information is related. And the clueless communicator who thought everyone got the memo they were changing the subject completely is left, well, clueless. Hilarity ensues. Want your dialogue to be fast paced, smooth and snappy? Showing a clear rapport and ease being on the same page between your characters. Yep, the maxim of relevance can be a huge help as it allows you to convey more information in less time. Why? Because you don't have to spell out the way the information is connected. If two pieces of information are strung together with only one main way to interpret the relationship, then that's all you need. Your audience wants the information to be connected, so they will assume that main interpretation. Guess what? As well as snappy, it also helps dialogue feel more real and natural because, well, that's how we speak. <laughs> it prevents the audience from feeling like they are being spoken down to or patronized. After all, if the information can be readily inferred, then it's not needed. So providing it flouts our good friend the maxim of quantity. Woohoo! Maxim inception! <laughs> Plus, because your reader is having to actively make inferences, they are engaged with the story. The inferences are easy, ones they are used to making in conversation all the time. So it's not a strain or a mental load, but it means they do actually have to read and pay that small amount of attention, increasing the chances of them being immersed. At the same time, because your reader is putting effort into understanding the world just like the main character is, it reduces the distance between reader and character, which is good for immersion not just into the world, but into the character's perspective. Yay! So yeah, following the maxim of relevance in dialogue is good. Flouting it where you want believable and understandable ambiguity and misunderstandings, also good. Don't go ham on it. Remember the point is that the inferences are easy and natural because we like things to be relevant. We will make them relevant. Also bear in mind with any prolonged misunderstanding, it can be hard to take too seriously if it can all be fixed with a simple clarifying question. That's why misunderstandings driving a plot works well in comedy. You're not being asked to take it seriously. Hardcore dramas hinging on a misunderstanding can get annoying. All right, that's all about dialogue and relevance, but what about narration? Of course, the same applies. Where the connection between information can easily be inferred, you don't have to spell it out. And doing so can be patronizing. The concept of relevance can also be applied more broadly. Chekhov's gun? It's just an extension of the expectation for information to be relevant. Your reader will expect the details they are being told to contribute to something. The characterization, the plot, the atmosphere, the world building, and you can use this expectation to plant red herrings. Things that are not actually relevant, though please do this with care as it can feel very well cheap. For me, the more useful application is hiding important information. Where? In plain sight, of course. Bring all the attention to it you want. So long as your reader can see a clear way it's relevant, they won't question if it might also be relevant in a second way. Fire Chekhov's gun in chapter two, and no one will be guessing it's going to make a reoccurrence as the all-important key to the mystery in chapter seven. All right, one to go, the Maxime of Mana. This one states that interlocutors expect information to be packaged in clear, concise, logical, unambiguous ways. In general, this one is more just prescribing like, yeah, be brief, be concise, say it logically, which is all good. You should definitely do that. But I want to talk about this more from manipulation than just be concise. And in that regards, that little point about readers expecting communication to be unambiguous is a little more interesting. It means your audience will basically try to interpret your communication any way they can, which avoids ambiguity. But hang on there, Goose. How can someone interpret an ambiguous statement to not be ambiguous? That doesn't make sense. He watched the man, he watched the man on the boat. What does that sentence mean? Chances are you thought it meant that person A is watching person B. Person B being on a boat. Could also mean that person A is on a boat. 
watching person be? You may or may not be on a boat. Regardless of which one you thought, you almost certainly only considered one of the options. Because once you had an interpretation, you assume the statement isn't ambiguous, so you don't go looking for more interpretations. This phenomenon plays out in series two of Taskmaster. Yeah, it, it's my favorite show, don't judge. Actually, judge away. Five contestants are given a task to put three exercise balls on the yoga mat on the hill. They are standing at the bottom of the hill with the three exercise balls in front of them. The mat is waiting for them on top of the hill. Four of them immediately go about struggling to push the exercise balls up the hill to where the mat waits, combating the wind, constantly blowing them away, and even enlisting passerbys to help. One contestant rereads the task a few times before he jogs up the hill, grabs the yoga mat, brings it down, and places the exercise balls on it. Back in the studio to debate who won, an argument erupts with the other four contestants crying that he cheated, didn't complete the task, no one would interpret those words in that way. And lexicographer Susie Dent has to be consulted to explain that actually, yep, it's a perfectly valid interpretation. So why didn't everyone immediately see the sentence was ambiguous? Why, even when they were shown the other interpretation, did it still seem wrong? Because we expect sentences to not be ambiguous. And once we have attributed a meaning to them, we don't think to check for other possible meanings and it becomes harder to view the sentence in another light. Like how once you see an option in an optical illusion, your brain can get kind of stuck on it, even if you know there is another way to view this image. For me, the maxim of manner is honestly something I often find myself more fighting with than utilizing. I love double meanings, complex plots, ambiguity and uncertainty, multiple perfectly valid ways of interpreting things. And it can be disheartening when beta readers seem to make assumptions pretty quick about which ways things are going and almost not even consider the other possible paths. It was puzzling, but the maxim of manner brings it into sharp clarity. People expect communication to be clear, ordered, and unambiguous, and they will make assumptions that ensure it is, even if those assumptions are wrong. It's become a very interesting little problem to think about and find ways to subtly highlight the multiple possibilities to make sure my readers are engaging with the various layers of the story. But at the end of the day, one of the reasons I like layers in a story is because it allows readers to engage at different levels, to engage with what interests them. Or the same person can read it differently multiple times. Regardless though, that sums up the four underlying assumptions that your readers will likely have about communication unless they're given reason to think otherwise. As I said earlier, this is just a discussion of ideas. It's not a sort of linguistic analysis um, and is more just about, you know, getting those brain juices flowing a little bit about how we can think about things a bit differently and how we can possibly manipulate things a little bit. I have not been shy in disclosing that for me, writing is all about manipulating the reader. That's what makes it fun. I have been talking about cooperative and uncooperative communication, but just to be clear, Grice's maxims are not the only part of that. There are many, many, many other variables and even just the difference between information being sent and information received is influenced by so many things and there's so many layers of semantics and pragmatics, the way that body language comes into it, the way it takes something like sarcasm, that how does that fit into it? Lots and lots of layers of complexity. This is just a brief little look at a few different things we can think about when we are attempting to manipulate our audience and convey information to them to either receive in the way intended or maybe not, maybe to be pulled down the garden path a little bit. But I have definitely rambled long enough for today. So I think it's time to say that's it from me. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and see you again soon. Interlocutor. Interlocutor.